Capitalism. The economic system in which all or most of the means of production and distribution, as land, factories, railroads, etc., are privately owned and operated for profit. Originally, under fully competitive conditions, it has been generally characterized by a tendency towards concentration of wealth, and in its later phase, by growth of great corporations, increased governmental control, etc. 2. The principles, methods, interests, power, influence, etc. of capitalists, especially those with large holdings. Like it or not, that is the definition of capitalism. There are no points to argue. You cannot argue with a dictionary. Dictionaries simply give a frame of reference to define what we are talking about, from which a conversation can begin with a common understanding. So now, let us examine the definition of capitalism to see whether or not it is a system designed for the greater good of all humanity, or if it's a means of exploitation of the many for the benefit of the few. To start, let us look at the first half of number one in the definition. The economic system in which all or most of the means of production and distribution as land, factories, railroads, etc. are privately owned and operated for profit. Here we begin. All or most privately owned for profit. That leads me to question, how did all or most become privately owned in the first place? The definition mentions land, and that would be a logical starting point, for you cannot have factories or railroads without the land to first put them on. So how did the capitalists get control of the land? They stole it. Plain and simple, they stole it. They got on boats originating in Europe, came to America with advanced weaponry and soldiers, and just took the land by force from the native inhabitants through pillage and murder. Now, after seizing control of the land, the exploitation of the natural resources of the land must have been the next logical step in the process. For you cannot put up a factory or lay rails over a forest. That takes labor. Someone needs to do the physical work in order to convert the natural resources into products that can be sold in order to have the capital to build the factories. So in come the job creators, also known as slave owners. Natives from military conquered territories became the cheap labor that the original capitalists used in order to acquire the wealth to support their enterprise. That, along with indentured servants who bought their passage to the land of the free by giving up their freedom for a number of years, was the original workforce of America. The free labor they produced made the capitalists extremely rich. Now, we come to the advent of industrialization, the building of factories, etc., the original mills and mines and sweatshop assembly lines in which the working class, the great plurality of impoverished workers, struggled and saved and scraped by in order to inch their way up the ladder over a period of generations, the backbone of the country who built the great society of today with their own hands while the owners the capitalists took in the lion's share of the profits from that labor and then wrapped their heads around the idea that they built the economic empire all by themselves, that they were entitled to the good life, while half the workers were paid to kill the other half of the workers, J.P. Morgan, the ones who demanded fair wages and benefits. That briefly is the history of early capitalism. Yet, before moving on, we must look also at the next part of the definition which states, originally under fully competitive conditions. Well, referring back to the indisputable history of capitalism, fully competitive would actually, in all reality, only include those who had the initial capital to invest into their enterprise. For the rest, for that startup capital, many turned to the banks for loans. These loans were made through fractional banking practices, the creation of capital out of thin air, and interest rates, ensured that the rich would continue to get richer, 
while opening up the possibility to a growing number of capitalists, which was only possible due to an expanding market, the expansion of colonization into the West and South, where more land and natural resources were waiting to be conquered. Remember, at this period of history, more capitalists were needed in order to capture the market. Capturing markets was only possible in many cases by war, occupation, and the overthrow of democratically elected governments, especially democratically elected communist governments. The investment in, and subsequently the profiting from, war became an essential part of capitalism. It's also important to note when discussing the term fully competitive, that this phrase is very misleading. For as most newly enterprising capitalists needed to borrow money from the banks in order to have the capital to invest, the banks had a great say in who actually received the loans for what purpose that money would be used. This led to a great disparity in banking practices, advantaging certain communities while disadvantaging others. This practice in the common tongue is known as redlining. Former slaves and other minorities, including women, were rarely able to receive loans to start a business. If they did, the terms were often and systematically more harsh than the terms offered to white males of class and privilege. Those same banking practices are still used widely today. Racism is an inherent and vital part of maintaining the structure of capitalism and cannot be ignored in this discussion. For those who control the initial capital control not only what types of products and manufacturing get invested in, but also who has the opportunity to exceed and grow within the system. Now, let us turn to the second half of the first part of the definition. It has been generally characterized by a tendency towards concentration of wealth. I believe we have already sufficiently covered this point with the agreement that under capitalism, the rich get richer. Yet, it is important to also point out that with the concentration of wealth, the stage where we've been under for quite some time now, with shrinking, not expanding resources, conquerable lands and markets, Fewer and fewer capitalists are actually required to maintain the system, which means less, not more, opportunities in the future. Finally, in this section, let us look at, and in its later phase by growth of great corporations, increased governmental control, etc. So wait, let's understand something here. There's a later phase of capitalism. Capitalism has a natural progression that cannot simply be halted. And once we have described so far to this point is merely the early phase, the good phase, the free market phase of capitalism. All that war and exploitation and discrimination that we talked about is the unregulated free market version of capitalism which all those pundits want the government to get out of the way of. Somehow, supporters of capitalism believe that if the government were to just simply step aside, the capitalists would miraculously regulate themselves, would no longer seek to maximize their profits, would be good stewards of the environment and economy, and every man for himself would live in peace and tranquility, that finally we would all be free. Who are they trying to kid? No one capitalist is an island to themselves. They are only able to benefit so greatly from the system because society is structured in a way that allows the one to be propped up by the many. But wait, now we have technology. Now they have global trading. The capitalists don't need the many. They can get their cheap labor overseas to hell with the common man, to hell with paying taxes for social services to support the society that they milk dry. That is why we have a government of the people, for the people, by the people. Because corporations are not people and need to be taxed and regulated so that the people 
our entire society can manage and thrive. We are all codependent on each other for our own well-being and the well-being of all. Now, let us look at the second part of the definition. Capitalism is. Two, the principles, methods, interests, power, influence, etc. of capitalists, especially those with large holdings. Principles, by definition, means the ultimate source, fundamental truth, law, doctrine, and motivating force. For capitalism, the stated and widely accepted driving principle is the profit motive. In other words, money. The single most important goal for capitalists is attaining personal, private wealth, and with it, power for themselves. That's it. By the definition of the word, the underlying principle of capitalism is greed. Methods. Let us recap the methods of capitalism so we do not forget. They are war, murder, slavery, exploitation, theft, and deception. Some may argue that hard work and dedication are also methods of attaining profit. However, those are in reality only minor contributing factors, for great wealth under capitalism derives primarily from being able to take as much as you can get by any means necessary. Interest. This again has already been clearly defined as profit. However, the ability to control the profit and the resources from which the profit is derived is by far the greatest of interest for the capitalist. For from that arrives the power in which to influence and control others, especially the politicians within the government who under the influence of the capitalists, instead of regulating them, clear the path for them to climb through the ranks and over the dead bodies left in the wake of capitalism, where they then arrive logically at the final position of world domination. So when we speak of capitalism, that is what we are speaking of.